Earlier, I interviewed Dr. William Darity, who is a professor at Duke University and co-author of From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Today, I am interviewing Kirsten Mullen, who is also a co-author of that book, as well as a writer, for, for, <laughs> folklorist, museum consultant, and lecturer. Before, Dr. Darity had spoken about the history of racial wealth inequity and the white terrorism and the ongoing discrimination. Today, I'm going to be asking Kirsten about the Reconstruction era, when hope was really there after the government had redistributed land formerly owned by the planters to the enslaved people, and black Americans got elected into legislatures, amendments got passed, and there was a whole lot of hope for true democracy. She will be talking about that. I have seen the Reconstruction described as all too a brief moment when the seeds of democracy were planted for all Americans by Blacks who were engaged in the political system with whites. Does that sound accurate to you? That is indeed. Um, you know, this was the moment when finally Black men, at least, uh, were uh, allowed to vote. Um, they could also run for public office. Um, black people, men and women, were actively uh, registering people to vote. They were canvassing for candidates that um, they viewed as allies, candidates that were pushing for um, more citizen rights for black people. And it was a very exciting, a very, you know, propitious moment. Um, Yes, and from what I have read, the the radical Republicans in the Southern Constitution, the Southern state constitutions, were the most progressive ever. Um, and do you want to elaborate on what what they did then? This is true. Um, you know, first they were very um, much interested in increasing the number of places people could vote. Mm -hmm. So you had these campaigns where. Um, you know, in some counties, there might not actually be a polling place. Um, and so that was one of the, the efforts that they undertook, was to make it possible for more people to have access. Right. Um, one of the other things that they did was um, advocate for public education. Yes. For, um, yes. This did not exist even for white children at the right. time. Right. And so, um, you know, the establishment of the public school system is one of the amazing hallmarks of this moment when black elected officials were active, especially across the South. Right. And I, I think that is really powerful that when black Americans got involved in the legislatures, they were focused on democracy for mm -hmm. everyone. Um, yes. And the civil rights bill that I didn't know about, really, what, that was passed in 1866. Mm -hmm. That was a surprise to me. That, mm -hmm. And they got the, uh, the amendments to the Constitution for citizenship and yes. voting through. Um, that's a powerful, powerful time and a very brief time. What, seven years after the Civil War? Sadly, um, yes. depending on how you count it. Um, you know, some states had more of the fragments of that, that movement that lasted, but basically seven to about 12 years was about the, the length of time. I think uh, we have, uh, W. E. B. Du Bois called it the seven mystic years. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I have, his book is very thick and there's so much in it, but I was trying to read some of the uh, information around the legislatures because it's just amazing what they got done in the Southern states. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, even resources for infrastructure yes. were put in place. Um, mm -hmm. Just imagine if that had continued, what do you think mm -hmm. that would have looked like? Wow. Well, I think if, uh, now we have to also add 
the presence of the Union soldiers. So this was a huge, um, a huge piece of the success of that Reconstruction moment. Um, you had in all of the major cities and certainly in the capitals of each state, um, battalions of Union soldiers who were on duty 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And they made certain that, um, you know, crimes and misdemeanors were, um, were dealt with. Um, you know, black, uh, black people themselves were not necessarily armed, but the union was there and Freedmen's Bureau agents eventually were on site and they, uh, theirs was the office. This was another federal, a federal uh, agency. They were in charge of collecting information about incidents um, and hazards that were occurring. They uh, also were involved in um, negotiating the contracts that these newly freed um, black people were entering into, sometimes with their former, uh, their former uh, masters, mm -hmm. but but often with others. Mm -hmm. And um, the Freedmen's Bureau also had a, a court system within it, and so one could bring complaints, one could bring concerns, one could report harms to the Freedmen's Bureau and expect to at least be heard. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, because uh, from what I was reading after the Civil War, where could the freed people go? I mean, so right. they did head yes. towards Union armies. Yes, absolutely. Where they were employed as farmers and all to, yeah. With... Exactly. Uh, and, and tens of thousands of people were on the roads, you know, trying to get to the closest Union right. outpost, um, looking for protection, but also for work. Right. Um, and they were put to work. Um, you know, they were the folks who were uh, building the breastworks, as they said, for, uh, you know, for the, the soldiers. They mm -hmm. were cooking. Uh, mm -hmm. They were scouts. Mm -hmm. um, they were cleaning and, and doing laundry and, you know, keeping, tending fires. Right. Um, you know, they were, you know, all of the admin, they were the essential workers, right? Of their right. Day. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so Reconstruction Era was a, a very hopeful time. You have talked about in your book, the Dismemory Project, and I do want to go into that because that's so powerful. So uh, talk to me about, please, about the Dismemory Project, what it is, and, um, and just what, a description of what, of, of all aspects of it. When uh, William Darity and I were conducting research for our book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century, uh, we were not well versed in the systemic work that we call dismemory. Um, this is organized projects aimed at forgetting mm -hmm. and distorting the nation's history. And, you know, this, this moment began immediately after the Civil War. Um, the Ku Klux Klan is, is founded in 1866. Right. And throughout this period of Reconstruction, um, some arms of the Klan literally wiped out individuals whose recollections of events, uh, recent events, differed from their own, right? Wow. So, you know, Black Union veterans, radical Republicans, and especially, you know, Black men who ran for public office or attempted to vote or organize were targeted. Um, but it wasn't just Blacks. I mean, mm -hmm. white legislators were murdered during this period. Uh, wow. Absolutely. Um, we learned about some of these atrocities from um, the report, and it was titled, The Report and Testimony of the Joint Select Committee to Inquire into the Condition of Affairs in the Late Insurrectionary States, you know, also known as the Klan Hearings. Mm -hmm. um, this is, these were uh, congressional hearings conducted in 1871. Uh, this is the 42nd Congress, and uh, 13 bound volumes, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. The transcripts were published a year later. They were incredibly efficient, um, and they're volumes dedicated to North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, okay? Um, that same year, 1866, According to the Encyclopedia of Virginia, we see this term lost cause. Right. 
Okay. And um, this, is, this may be the first time that it appeared in print. And, and would you please just define that for those who may not be familiar with that naming so, of the Civil War? <laughs> so, yes, the lost cause is indeed um, um, the term this, the, that uh, Confederates and sympathizers use to romanticize, to soften, mm -hmm. uh, to redirect our focus from the Civil Wars having been fought so that Southerners could retain the right to own Black people. Right. And so instead, they were focusing on heritage and Southern culture, um, but also on states' rights. And, you know, self-determination was very much what they were talking about in Lost Cause. But when you look at the documents that each of the states that seceded from the Union created, all of them, first and foremost, underscore the importance of slavery. Right, right. All of them make clear that the reason that they are taking this step, this amazing, you know, monumental step to leave, withdraw from the Union, is because slavery was essential to their way of life. Mm -hmm. And they absolutely were not willing not prepared to let that go. Right. So that is the cause that they lost. Right. Their heroic cause, though, is described differently. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So um, uh, this publication, uh, The Lost Cause, A New Southern History of the War of the Confederates. This was um, popularized by um, a Richmond Examiner newspaper writer, uh, Edward Pollard. So then we see the term uh, immortalized in a poem by that name, which was accessioned by the Library of Congress in 1872. Hmm. So the aim of these efforts indeed was to mask the Confederacy's role as secessionists and traitors who lost the war. Right. 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 You know, they wanted to be able to say to their children and grandchildren, we fought the good fight. Yes. You know, we just didn't have enough people or we didn't have enough time. You know, if we had had just a little more, you know, money, a few more bodies, we could have won this war because it was a good fight and God was on our side. Of course. Right. Of course, right. Uh, you know, but this, so when you're looking at the patterns of dismemory projects, um, the largest sustained spike that we've seen of active forgetting these activities occurs between 1900 and 1920. Um, this is about the 50 year mark after the civil war. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a big anniversary event. There are parades all over the country. Um, Confederate veterans are marching, wearing their uniforms. Um, this is a moment when they are featured in the newspaper as heroes across the South. Um, monuments are being placed in very public spaces, courthouse grounds, city halls, schools, mm -hmm. um, many street names, military bases, uh, and cities bear the name of these resurrectionists, um, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, Nathan Bedford Forrest. We just realized recently that our neighbor city, Carborough, C-A-R-R-B-O-R-O, -R -R -O, is named for Julian Carr, who was um, an industrialist yeah. and also uh, a philanthropist. Uh, but he is uh, one of the people who um, was invited to come to the dedication of Silent Sam. And Silent Sam is the, in fact, the, the anonymous, uh, the, every, the every man Confederate soldier, soldier right. who's, um, who's, whose figure stands or, or did stand on uh, near the entrance to the campus of the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Right. And there were years when individuals and then groups organized to petition the university to remove the statue. And that finally did happen. Um, but that's just one of many. Um, you know, um, the 1920s also when you begin to see groups lobbying to have a Confederate holiday in their state. Uh -huh. um, and um, there are at least seven states, including North Carolina, that honor these individuals despite the fact that they were traitors to the Republic. Um, there are at least 
1,500 such monuments in the United States um, as late as 2016. Yes, yeah. And people are still raising money to build them. Um, I'm trying to remember, um, was it, where was, where, there was a statue of Lee that was brought down. Richmond. In, in Richmond. I was, I was thinking yes. it was Richmond. And the grandson yes. was there to say this needs to be done. But there yes. were also folks who were saying, and now we need to just raise money to build an even bigger one. Oh, for God's sakes. You know, so, you know, we're definitely divided in this country about what, what our history is. Right. And who we want to be going forward. Um, you know, deep into the 20th century, um, the facts of enslavement and the early and sustained efforts of black abolitionists and their supporters were suppressed. Um, what we see instead is the rise of um, the Daughters of the American Revolution. Yes. You know, and the persistent and ongoing efforts of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which is founded in 1894, uh, to raise money, you know, to erect these monuments um, and basically monuments to the lost cause. Um, so um, they also conducted genealogical research and uh, documented the lives of the Civil War veterans. Right. And they lobbied states to build archives um, that would become repositories for these men's stories. And in fact, for a number of state archives, those uh, materials were the original um, collections. Right. Well, they had an incredibly coordinated effort, didn't they, to uh, influence textbooks in schools, attending education conferences yes. and sanctioning authors, blacklisting others. Absolutely. And when that didn't succeed, um, they commissioned uh, authors themselves or wrote textbooks themselves. Right. Yes. And what's amazing is how long those textbooks endured. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them were still being used into the 1960s. Now, some of this says a whole lot about just the state's uh, superintendents of education, that mm -hmm. they would allow textbooks uh, on any subject mm -hmm. to be uh, in continuous use for 60, 70 years. But that's mm -hmm. exactly what happened. But it's not as if we don't have, you know, new textbooks being minted with these um, incorrect, um, uh, you know, highly questionable portrayals of black people and slavery. Uh, you may recall um, uh, just a year or two ago in uh, Texas, right? Um, uh, a, a mother, Ronnie Dean Burren of Pearland, Texas, which is near Houston, uh, was alerted by her son, Kobe Burren, uh, about his uh, geography textbook. This is a McGraw Hill, McGraw Hill's an education mm -hmm. publisher. And um, he sent his mother a, a photo of the text. And the picture shows a graphic, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about immigration patterns. And the caption reads, quote, the Atlantic slave trade between the 1950s and 1800s brought millions of workers from Africa to the southern United States to work on agricultural plantations. Oh, <laughs> okay. oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a huge story. Uh, I think the New York Times covered it. Wow. You know, and this 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 notion of workers implies that they yes. were receiving willingly, right? Not only willing, but they're being paid. Yeah, yeah right, 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 you know? right. That you know they they came to the United States for career right. opportunity. This made their lives better. Right, right, right. You know, they, they, they considered all the places in the world they could go, and this is where they decided <laughs> their best opportunity oh, you know, could be found. This is where they wanted to raise their children. Right. And um, it was all about choice. You know, we're all about choice in this country. So, oh, it, you know, yeah. we, haven't, we haven't passed that point. No, um, no. You know, when I was in school, in grade school, there might have been four, six pages, four or six pages on black people, period, in the history book. Right. And invariably, there'd be a picture of, you know, people picking cotton. There might be a picture of a black musician, uh, possibly mm -hmm. a photo of black people dancing. And then we would jump to Booker T. Washington. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's true. George Washington Carver. 
Right. And even though I was in school in the 60s, no one was talking about what was actually happening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, in the present moment. And no one was making those connections. You right. know, I think, too, about just how history, for me, often was taught uh, in the form of, you know, dates, places, um, you know, my co Memorizing, yes. Memorization. You know, Sandy talks about having to memorize heaps. So he was in North Carolina at the point where um, state's history was being taught, being focused on. And he had to learn the names of every county seat. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Not clear. I have no idea. Not clear. Um, I, uh, my older sister, um, I remember when she was, you know, uh, taking American history and she'd have these reams and reams of lists that she had to memorize. And uh, our whole family would be involved in helping her, you know, try to, to master this material. You know, you sit down, and you just like spill it out of your brain as fast as possible because uh-huh. you're never going to use any of this again. But, you know, I can remember uh, we created songs and mnemonics, all kinds of, of name and word games to help her cement this stuff in her brain. But I can remember 1862, the Homestead Act, Marill Act. Department of <laughs> Agriculture, but no one talked about the importance right. of those right. acts. I mean, we now know that this was, you know, the Homestead Acts, the, um, and these are like the late 1860s. These were moments when white Americans were given land grants of 160 acres uh, this was an effort to settle the Western part of the United States. Now, right. this is after the newly uh, freed Black people who had been promised 40 acres, not 60, but 40 acres, and then didn't get that. Right. right. Now, if someone had explained that to me when I was in high school, I probably would have become a historian. Right. Oh, I I remember history being the most one of the most boring subjects ever in high school because it was just memorization and unrelated, um, with no uh, political or social awareness at all being presented. Well, and the parts of of the history lessons that I received that did connect to my life were so negative, right? That you wanted to run from it. Right. It wasn't something you wanted to attach yourself to. Right. Uh, can you also uh, talk a little bit about the, because you have before, about the Dismemory Project and how um, the legislators, the Black legislators were portrayed in paintings and museums, oh, yes. et cetera, because I think that's so important, the devaluing, degrading that was done. There were a few exceptions. Um, you know, I mean, just stop and take a look at our book to, to um, there's one that we actually h- highlight in, in uh, From Here to Equality. But, but you're right, for the most part, um, black legislators, just black people, period, mm-hmm. were uh, depicted in stereotypes, caricatures. Um, and then I think about, you know, both the newspaper cartoons that were ubiquitous. Right. It was so rare to see a photograph uh, this is one of the triumphs of Frederick Douglass, who understood so well the power of the image. Mm. You know, he very um, determinedly curated his image. When he would go to a new city to give a talk, he would seek out the photographers in those towns and sit for them, knowing that the, their work would appear in the local newspapers. Um, and he was always certain to be in a very dapper suit, and to look his best because he was aware that white people, especially, but also black people, needed to see a black person represented in a different way. Yes. Um, yes. And then in, when you have the advent of the moving picture, right? You know, two of the most influential films uh, early on, Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind, both depict black Americans and especially politically engaged Black people as buffoons, as uh, frightening, scary boogeymen. Mm -hmm. You you have actually in Birth of a Nation uh, scenes from um, the congressional halls and um, 
the black legislators are barefooted. They're eating watermelon and fried chicken. Mm-hmm. They've got their feet up on the desks mm-hmm. uh, with no regard, no respect uh, for the office. When in fact, what we have learned through our research is just the opposite. Right. You know, right. black people were very much invested in having representatives who were learned, who were um, personable. Um, sometimes they might, the suit they were wearing might have been purchased from the funds that were uh, raised by a community. So important was it to black people to have their representative look um, like someone who belonged there, right? Yeah. And yeah. they were learned. These were men who often were college educated. These were men who read the law. Some of them were lawyers. They took mm-hmm. the work very seriously. Mm-hmm. But this is when you, uh, again, the lost cause folks are at work. You know, they're right. characterizing any black politically engaged person or white persons, you know, carpetbaggers and scalawags. Uh, and this is something we hear today. You know, anytime. Uh, black people uh, are advocating for their for their rights when anytime they are pointing out slights and atrocities then it must be some outsider who has come and made you know these uh, you know these these problems apparent it couldn't possibly be something that black people themselves figured out because they're they're incapable right of, of, of seeing uh, these problems, or if they see them, they accept them as the way things are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but yes, you see that very early. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, today, um, and, and I want to talk about reparations in light of what's going on today. But I just read yesterday that the Marine commander or uh, has that marine bases will get rid of the confederacy the flag ah yes and that's an amazing uh happening right well or that they're there in the first place well yes you know or that confederate flags were routinely hung uh you know uh on in, Iraq, yes. in iran in afghanistan vietnam um you know not to speak of all these college campuses uh, you know, uh, and, and schools whose mascot, you know, is a Confederate soldier or whose school song is Dixie. Uh, one of my college roommates, uh, who's, who grew up in Houston, uh, is a black woman. Uh, she was a musician and she was in the band, in the marching band at her school. And she attended Robert E. Lee High School. And they wore uh, Confederate gray and Dixie was their school song. And she said it was humiliating yes. to wear yes. that uniform. Uh, I think that was the fate of a lot of black people, you mm-hmm. know, especially after, uh, after uh, uh, integration. You know, they closed the black school and no one's talking about what it means for these black students to be in a Robert E. Lee or a Jefferson mm-hmm. Davis school, mm-hmm. an Alexander Stevens school. Mm-hmm. Um, it's quite amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. It is amazing. 